Hello, I'm Ranger Mara at Shenandoah National Park. Since you can't be here to see our wildflowers in bloom, we thought we would bring some of them to you by way of a virtual wildflower walk. My videographer Neil and I are going to be keeping our social distancing so we can bring you up close and personal to some of our wildflowers. These are what we call our spring ephemerals, flowers that are only here for a short time, bloom, and then we won't see them again until next spring. There are about 850 flowering species of plants in Shenandoah National Park and many of those are native. In the springtime what happens is our hardwood trees, our forests are starting to leaf out again after not having leaves all winter and as those leaves begin to come out at the lower elevations first where it's warmer, the wildflowers below them try to get the sunlight and, and attract pollinators. It's important for them to stay out of the deep shade. Once those trees have fully leafed out it's too shady for them so the flowers are keeping ahead of the, the uh, leafing out trees every day a little bit higher and up, up the mountains the leaf out is happening and the wildflowers are pushing ahead of them. Today we're between about 3,000 and 3,500 feet in elevation, so we're pretty high up in the mountains and the trees have not leafed out here yet. So you know what that means. There will be wildflowers. So if you're ready, let's go and see what we can find. This is the large flowered trillium, one of our showiest wildflowers in the park. It's got three petals, three sepals, those are the green parts underneath. These would have protected the bud as the flower is uh, before it blooms, and three uh, leaves. So easy to remember, trillium three. So trillium is takes a lot of energy to make a big flower like this, and sometimes it takes up to six years for a, a trillium like this to put out its first flower. Once it flowers and it gets pollinated, got a nice landing platform there for bees, once it's pollinated the flowers will slowly fade to pink. So you may see some pink flowers mixed in with the white ones. And once the flower is pollinated, a seed will form and it will drop to the ground below the, the parent plant. There the seeds are often picked up by ants. Ants will take them to their underground nests where they don't eat the seed but they eat a strip of material on that seed called a strophiole. And then they take the seed and toss it out in the trash, sometimes as far as 30 yards from the parent plant. And that's the way some trilliums spread instead of all staying right in one spot. Nature makes some lovely bouquets in the springtime and one of those is the star chickweed, the plant that we have here. Looking from a distance, you might see 10 petals on these little dime-sized flowers of the star chickweed. But when you look closely, you'll see that there really are only five, but each petal is, is deeply split, almost to the base. So there's really only five petals on each flower. And that's a characteristic of, of the family that star chickweed is in, that is the pink family. Pink doesn't have anything to do with the color of the flowers. It's referring to pinking, which is a notching on the edge of the petals. A lot of flowers in this family, like carnations, have a kind of a, a, a pinked or a notched edge. Um, so these ones are a wonderful representative of the pink family. Even though they're not pink, they're white. One wildflower that's pretty abundant in the springtime here in Shenandoah uh, is the violet. And there are quite a variety of violets. One of the neat things about them is that they're not always violet color. We've got the violet purple or blue violets, like the common blue violet, which we have here. But right next to it, there is this beautiful yellow violet. This is the smooth yellow violet. And the flower is very similar, different color. We also have some white violets here in Shenandoah. Violets are pollinated by bees, smaller bees. A lot of our native solitary bees are small and they will fit right into those flowers, get the nectar, and then come back out having pollinated the flowers. Violets have what are called nectar guides. These are dark lines on the petals that direct the pollinator, the bee, whatever's going to pollinate it, right to that sweet spot right in the, in the middle. Violets are also important host plants for certain butterflies. The family of fritillary butterflies in the park, like the great spangled fritillary, 
their caterpillars will only eat uh, leaves of violets. So without violets, you don't have certain butterfly species. So there's an important connection going on there with violets and butterflies. This is one of the coolest wildflowers in Shenandoah National Park. It's called Jack in the Pulpit. It has two parts on its flower. The pulpit, which is called the spade, and Jack inside is a column, and that's called the spadix. At the bottom of the Jack, or the spadix, is where the flowers are. Each plant will have either all male flowers or all female flowers at the bottom of that spadix. So it depends on the nutrient level under the ground whether each plant is going to be a male or a female plant. If there's a lot of nutrients underground, that plant could be a female. So we call her a Jill instead of a Jack. If their nutrient level isn't really good, that plant next year will be a, a male plant. What's interesting is the same plant can change. So this male plant, if it gets a lot of nutrients uh, next year, may become a female plant. This one is a jewel right here. How can you tell the difference? Males have just one leaf coming off of the stalk, three leaflets. Females have two. Here's one, there's two. It takes more nutrients to make seeds than it does to make pollen, and that's why females take up more energy. This is a really interesting plant. This is called wild ginger. It's very um, easily recognized by its heart-shaped leaves that are fuzzy on the bottom. They're a low-growing plant. They often like moist places like this uh, on a stream. This one is right by a water bar uh, that drains the water off the side of the trail there. But what's also cool about these is that they have a beautiful flower, but they're very, very hard to see. In fact, from where you are right now and from where I am, it's hard to see the flowers on these uh, wild ginger plants. That's because you have to look way down low and these flowers are often at the very base of the, the leaves right on the ground. They're a very beautiful three pointed petal uh, flower like a tube and you might wonder why is it down there. A lot of times the flowers of wild ginger are growing under the leaf litter so we can't even see them but little insects that are under that leaf litter will crawl in there looking for something to eat and get pollen on their bodies, come out and pollinate the flower. So wild ginger is dependent on insects that are at the ground level to crawl into those flowers and pollinate them. Yes, wild ginger does have a, a root that has um, a kind of a spicy uh, a flavor to it, but it's very mild and it's not something that you want to go and into the woods and dig up, especially, and this is a good time to, to bring up this point, in our national parks, all of our wildflowers are protected, so we don't want you to go in and dig up any of the plants for uh, eating or for carting away to your gardens at home. This is one of our showier spring wildflowers. It's called golden ragwort. It's a member of the composite family, or the daisy family, and you can see how the flowers look like daisy flowers. They've got a, a central um, disc of flowers and then ray flowers coming out of, the, out of the sides. It's called ragwort because those petals, they're not in a nice neat order around the disc in the center. They're kind of raggedly uh, spread around that flower head. But they're a beautiful sunny flower. They're tall. They've got leaves that are sort of rounded at the base. There are other types of ragworts, but golden ragwort is going to be our earliest blooming flower in that family. And they have a golden yellow color. Other ragworts may be a sunnier yellow. What you might notice about the ragwort is that the flower buds are not yellow. They're a, a deep maroon. And so people all often ask us, you know, what are those flowers going to be, those red flowers? <laughs> but they're not going to be red. They're just red when they're in the bud stage. And then those buds will open up and you'll have these beautiful yellow golden ragwort flowers. You may notice some beautiful tree blossoms all around me. This is apple blossom time in Shenandoah National Park. Now apples are not native to North America. They were brought here by uh, immigrants from Europe long ago, 
but there are a lot of apple trees still here in the park. Some of these may be over a hundred year old trees, so it's wonderful to see them blooming and know that people planted these many years ago. If you look at the flowers, they're a gorgeous, large, pinkish white. The, the buds will have a little tinge of pink on there and then they'll open to a beautiful white flower. Apples are a member of the rose family and so their flowers are going to look a bit like roses. They'll have five petals uh, like that. So many of our fruit trees are members of the rose family, uh, just like the apple tree. So here in Shenandoah there are probably thousands of apple trees still here from long ago when people planted them by their homesteads and in orchards. This is a small flower here in Shenandoah, but it's an important one to wildlife. This is wild strawberry, and it is related to the strawberries that you get at the grocery store. But these strawberries are much smaller, uh, very sweet, and important food for birds and animals. Box turtles, these are right at their level to reach up and grab one of those. Whenever a flower is pollinated, it will begin to form that seed, and everywhere there was a flower successfully pollinated, you'll get the fruit on there. So these strawberries will be ripe in June. A good way to recognize the plant is the three leaflets here with the toothed edges on them. Now because this is a small flower, sometimes it's hard to see. If you get close enough to them, but you don't have a hand lens or um, a magnifier, uh, you can use your binoculars to help you out. Just turn them upside down, look in the wrong end, and that will bring these flowers up just like you were using a magnifying glass. So give that a try next time you're out in the wild. Thank you for joining us today on our virtual wildflower walk. I hope you go away with a better understanding and maybe a little more appreciation for the amazing variety of wildflowers that, we, that are protected here in our national parks. From Shenandoah National Park, this is Ranger Mara. See you next time.